All right, this is Charlie. Welcome to Chapter 3. Chapter 3 is on pressure, winds, and currents. In the background, that's Phoenix, Arizona, with a massive dust storm about to swallow the city. Here's a bunch of stuff that you're probably not going to read. Here are the big main questions for this chapter. Why do we have wind? What are the patterns of air and ocean circulation? And how do multi-year oscillations affect weather? We will tackle all these questions in this chapter. So, one of the most important things for you to know, air flows from high pressure to low air pressure. Think of a balloon, the air pressure inside the balloon is higher than the air pressure in the room. So when you let your fingers off the end of a balloon, the air goes from the high pressure inside the balloon to the low pressure in the room. There's a shot of earth.nullschool.net showing four hurricanes in the Pacific simultaneously. Air pressure measurement. Air molecules exert more force when they're closer together and less when they're farther apart. You can use a mercury barometer. I'll talk about that in just a second. But almost nobody uses mercury barometers because they're toxic. They can cause brain damage, other uh, neurological problems. Nowadays, we use aneroid barometers. Aneroid means without liquid, so it's just a barometer without mercury. So on the right-hand side, we've got a mercury barometer and some standard sea level air pressure equivalents. 1,013.2 millibars, 14.7 pounds per square inch, one kilogram per square centimeter, and the weight of the atmosphere is equal to the weight of the mercury that's suspended in that tube. So Evangelista Torricelli was the first person to make a barometer. He took a glass tube, filled it with mercury, turned it upside down, put it into a dish of mercury, unplugged it, so the mercury in the top dropped down under the weight of gravity, making a vacuum at the top. So the only thing that's going to change on the outside is the amount of air pressure pressing on the surface of the mercury. If the molecules are closer together, if the air pressure is higher, then the vacuum is going to pull the mercury up the tube. Because remember, the air pressure is equal to the weight of the mercury suspended in that tube. The weight of the atmosphere, the weight of the molecules in the atmosphere weighs as much exactly as the weight of the mercury in that tube. So when there's a storm coming, storms are associated with low air pressure, there's going to be less weight pressing on the surface of the mercury, and so the mercury in the tube is going to drop down. So the air pressure is lower, the weight of the mercury in the tube is going to be lower because there's going to be less weight of the atmosphere pressing down on the surface of the mercury. So the other two the other two measurements of air pressure, 760 millimeters of mercury, which is equal to 29.92 inches of mercury. So in that case, instead of actual pressure, we're looking at the weight of a column of mercury and comparing that with the weight of the atmosphere. The highest air pressures recorded in the United States under very cold conditions, Barrow, Alaska in January, and the lowest air pressure recorded in hurricanes. Tropical hurricanes typically are the places where you're going to find the world's lowest air pressure. 882 millibars. Remember, normal average sea level pressure is 1,013.2 millibars. So wind, here's just the definition, horizontal motion of air caused by differences in air pressure. If there's no difference in air pressure between two places, there's no wind. We use an anemometer to measure wind speed, and a wind vane tells us the direction the wind is blowing from, because that's the way winds are named. Admiral Beaufort was an admiral in the British Navy, and he thought it would be cool to allow people to record observations of wind and then later be able to go back and figure out exactly how strong the wind was. So he created this table. For example, of Beaufort 3, if you were out taking field notes someplace and you didn't have an anemometer with you, you could make note of what's going on around you. For example, small trees began to sway. That's going to be a 5 on the Beaufort scale and indicates 19 to 24 miles an hour wind speed. Cars veering on road, that's going to be an 8 
on the Beaufort scale, and that's going to be equal to 3946 miles an hour of wind speed. So the idea of the Beaufort scale was you could just look around, get some idea what was going on, write those details down, and then later you'd have a really more, you'd have a much more accurate idea of how strong the wind was. Winds are named for the direction they come from. Like that kid that moved into your class from Texas that you called Tex, a wind blowing from the north is a north wind. A wind blowing from the south is going to be a south wind. There are some wind directions, north, south, west, east. There are four forces that drive wind. There's the pressure gradient force, which is the most important. Air flows from high pressure to low pressure, just like water flowing downhill. There's the gravitational force, although really that just means that we have an atmosphere. If we didn't have any gravity, we wouldn't have any atmosphere. Coriolis force is an apparent deflection caused by the rotation of Earth. Remember, the Earth rotates faster at the equator than it does at the poles. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. And then finally, friction. Friction slows down wind speed next to the ground. And friction also reduces the effect of Coriolis for wind close to the ground. And when I say close to the ground, I mean from the surface up to about 1,500 feet above the ground or above the highest point at the surface of the ground. So we've got gravitational force. Gravity is pulling everything towards the center of Earth. Air pressure is highest at Earth's surface. As you go up through Earth's atmosphere, air pressure decreases with atmosphere. So next up is the pressure gradient force. The pressure gradient force drives air from high air pressure to low air pressure. The difference in air pressure between two places is what we call the pressure gradient. That tells us how strong or how much of a difference there is in air pressure between two places. If there's a big difference, we say there's a strong pressure gradient and you'd expect to find high wind speed. Again, pressure gradient force drives air from high pressure to low pressure. If there's no difference in wind, uh, if there's no difference in air pressure between two places, there's no difference in wind speed. Cold, dense air typically has higher air pressure than warm, less dense air. And isobar, that's a key term, that's a line that connects equal points of air pressure. When the isobars are closely spaced, that means that there's a really rapid change in air pressure with space. So there's a lot of change with a little distance, so you'd expect to find really high wind speeds there. And where the isobars are farther apart, you'd expect to find lower wind speeds. So here's a diagram out of the textbook. And you can see, let me grab a pointer. You can see over here there's light winds where the isobars are far apart. Over here there's strong winds because the isobars are much closer together. So on a weather map, this region would have lower winds. This region would have higher winds. This is a website called WindyTie, windy.com, and we can see lines of equal air pressure. They're labeled. This is 30 inches of mercury, 29.94 inches of mercury, and you can see little streak lines indicating the speed of the wind. So here, we looks like we have the lowest wind speed, uh, two knots. Over here, we have six knots, and you can see that the isobars are much farther apart than they are over here. Where the isobars are really close together, that's where we're going to find the strongest wind speed, 36 knots. Over here, 38 knots. Up here, the isobars are farther apart, so we'd expect a lower wind speed, 7 knots, 16 knots, 34 knots, 1 knot, 6 knots, 33 knots. Coriolis force is the third force we're going to talk about. Uh, it's caused because Earth rotates faster at the equator than it does at the poles. Probably the most important thing to remember about Coriolis force is moving objects are deflected to their right in the northern hemisphere. They're deflected to their night to their right, not the right. There is no the right, but as they move, objects in the northern hemisphere are deflected to their right in the direction of Coriolis rotation. 
and in the southern hemisphere it's the opposite, moving objects are deflected to their left. Coriolis force is zero at the equator and Coriolis deflection increases as you move away from the equator and approach the poles. The greater the, different, the, the, greater the distance the air travels, the greater the deflection there is on Coriolis deflection, Coriolis force. And here we can see an example of some objects in the northern hemisphere deflecting to their right, deflecting to their right. Objects in the southern hemisphere are deflected to their left. And that's going to set up the pattern of ocean circulation. It's going to set up the pattern of hurricanes in the northern hemisphere, cyclones in the southern hemisphere. Friction is the last force. Friction slows down wind speed and reduces Coriolis deflection from the surface up to about 500 meters. So if we put all these together, when there is high pressure, the air is descending and diverging. Where there's low pressure, the air is converging and ascending. So we call air flowing out of high pressure an anticyclone. Air flowing into an area of low pressure is cyclonic flow or a cyclone, which is kind of confusing. That's also the term for the hurricanes in the southern hemisphere are called cyclones. But cyclonic airflow just refers to air flowing into an area of low pressure. So that would be flowing in, rotating counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere, flowing in, rotating, rotating clockwise in the southern hemisphere. Above 500 meters, remember, there's no friction, and so the winds just flow parallel to the isobars. They're just under the influence of pressure gradient force. They start to flow from high to low. They get deflected by Coriolis, head off to the right, and they never come back. So here is one of the animations from the textbook. If we have rising air, low pressure in the northern hemisphere, the air is converging and ascending. As the air rises, it expands and cools. Remember, if you want to make it rain, you need to lift air up. So in the northern hemisphere, cyclonic airflow flows in, rotates counterclockwise, and it rises. And then if there's high pressure, it starts air converges aloft, it sinks. So in an area of high pressure at the surface in the northern hemisphere, the pattern is the air is descending, it's sinking, and then it hits the ground and spreads out, flowing out clockwise. So the air in an anticyclone in the northern hemisphere, it's descending, diverging, and rolling out clockwise. As the air comes out, it gets deflected to the, to the right, to its right rather, creating clockwise movement. Also, as the air sinks, it gets compressed, it heats up, the relative humidity drops, clouds typically evaporate, and so high pressure is associated with sunny skies, low pressure, rising air, associated with storms. So here's the diagram out of the book showing northern hemisphere, air flowing into low pressure, rotating counterclockwise, and then down here at the surface, let me pick up the pointer, down here at the surface, if we have sinking air, it's descending and then diverging, flowing out clockwise. But then that air flows out of the clockwise into converging pattern. So it's going to flow counterclockwise into this area of low pressure, and then it's going to rise. Get rid of that pointer. So wind, wind patterns in general, driven by an energy surplus at the equator and an energy deficit at the poles. Energy is transferred from the tropics to the poles. There's mechanical movement of actual molecules of air, uh, molecules of water, ocean currents are set up. The surface currents are, are a function of wind. And also latent heat, which we'll talk about later. As water evaporates from the tropics, it gets transported to the mid-latitudes and the Antarct to the Arctic. As the air gets transported from the tropics to the Arctic, it doesn't necessarily transport really hot air, but there's enormous amount of latent heat. So when that water vapor condenses, it releases the heat into the atmosphere in the mid latitudes and the subarctic. This is a diagram showing all of the all of the wind belts. I'm going to pick up the pointer again. So we've got low pressure along the equator. It's hot. Air is rising, making the Hadley cells. Some of that air sinks, 
right around the tropics, making the subtropical high. This would be the Pacific high. This would be the Bermuda high. As the air flows from the tropics to the equator, that sets up the northeast trade winds, as well as the southeast trade winds. Part of that wind blowing from the subtropical high towards the polar front, this area of low pressure. This area of low pressure again, the polar front, the Aleutian low, the Icelandic low. That sets up the westerlies as the air flows from the subtropical high to the polar front, flows north, gets deflected to the right, becomes the westerlies. So now we've got warm, moist air coming up with the westerlies. At the North Pole, it's cold, so there's sinking air. That's where the polar high-pressure cells are. Uh, it's also going to set up the polar easterlies, these cold, dry winds blowing out of the pole. And then when the cold air and the warm air meet, the warm air gets lifted up, forming the polar front. So this also is going to create patterns of weather. Along the equator, there's the ITCZ with air rising daily, giving us thunderstorms, so hot and wet along the ITCZ. The sinking air caused by the Hadley cells, that sinking air is going to create the subtropical high pressure zones with the world's deserts. So Mexico, Saudi Arabia, the Atacama Desert down in South America, all of those are under the subtropical high pressure cells. Those are regions of hot and dry climate. Again, the tropical air, warm and moist, flowing up to the poles where it's cold and dry. That's going to create an area of storms along the polar front. And so the weather along the polar front is going to be cool and wet. And then the poles finally are cold and dry. So another animation out of the book. And this time it's going to set up all of those patterns that we were just talking about. We have rising air over the equator. It rises, it expands, it cools, and it sinks, forming two convection cells called the Hadley cells on either side of the ITCZ. Let me get the pointer. No, it's not working. So we've got along the equator, we've got low pressure with air rising. So that's going to be making daily patterns of rain. Then we have sinking air. That's going to create another weather belt. That's going to be hot and dry in there. The sinking air and the rising air, both of those are going to create two wind belts. So that sinking air, some of it's going to flow from the tropics back to the equator. That's going to make the northeast and southeast trade winds. And then some of that is going to flow from the Subtropics up to the mid-latitudes, that's going to create the westerlies. So again, the subtropical high pressure associated with really dry conditions, low pressure along the equator, tropical rainforests, the world's deserts. And then, and then finally, the polar easterlies combining with the westerlies are going to make the polar front where that warm air gets lifted up, making an area of cool and rainy conditions. In reality, it's a bit, these, these areas of low pressure are a little too high. I would have put them down here a little bit because this is where the, the storms come in the wintertime. They track along the polar front. And there's the pattern of wind circulation. So these areas of primary, the primary high and low pressure areas, again, these are global patterns of circulation. These are global averages. These are global patterns of pressure and motion. The day-to-day -day conditions are going to change. These are more like averaged out over month after month after month, year after year. This is generally where the pressure belts are and where the wind is moving. We have the high and low pressure areas, and each of those has their own distinct climatic feeling. So there's the ITCZ, hot and wet along the tropics, along the equator. The polar high pressure cells are cold and dry. Those are at the north and south poles. The subtropical high pressure cells are going to be hot and dry. This is where the world's deserts are. And then the subpolar low pressure cells, uh, we keep, I'm going to keep calling it the polar front, the Aleutian low, 
the Icelandic low, those are areas of cool and wet climate. So here we've got January typical surface conditions. You can see the position. Let me pick up the pointer. Here's the ITCZ along the equator. It's cold, so there's very high pressure over Siberia. There's the Icelandic low, the Aleutian low. Here we've got the Hawaiian or Pacific high, then the Azores high. And you'll notice here's the ITCZ, and this is a map showing rainfall. You can actually see the really, really good correlation between the ITCZ and lots and lots of rain. And then the subtropical highs with dry conditions, subtropical high, dry conditions, subtropical high, dry conditions, subtropical high, dry conditions. So in January in California, the Hawaiian high shifts south, so the air circulates around it. The Aleutian low gets bigger. It also drops south, so now air is rotating counterclockwise around the low, clockwise around the high. So the storms that track in across the ocean come into California. In the summertime, in July, the Pacific high gets beefy. The Aleutian low kind of shifts north, gets really weak. The Bermuda high gets really big. So now we have air rotating clockwise out of the Pacific high, and that tends to block storms. So the storms, as they flow across, are going to flow parallel to these isobars, and they're going to end up in uh, British Columbia, up in Canada. Same in the southern hemisphere, you've got high pressure flowing towards the tropics, high pressure flowing towards the tropics. High pressure flowing towards the tropics here is going to set up the Asian monsoon. So there's high pressure over the ocean, low pressure inland. The air flows over the ocean. It picks up lots and lots of moisture, runs into the mountains, gets lifted up, and you have intense rain for a couple months in the summertime in India. Wintertime is the dry season, and We'll look at we'll look at a video of the ITCZ in a minute. So here we've got January conditions again. You can see the ITCZ has shifted south into the southern hemisphere along with the subsolar point. Here we have July conditions. The ITCZ has shifted north over Southeast Asia over South Asia, shifted north, shifted north, shifted north. And then the prevailing winds coming out of it in January, you've got the northeast trade winds and the westerlies, the northeast trades and the westerlies, northeast trade winds coming out of coming out of India. So December, January in India, it's going to be dry, it's going to be hot, it's going to be dusty with all this air flowing out of Siberia where it's cold, but then as it goes over the mountains, it's going to expand, get even colder, but then drop down into India. And as the air drops down, it's going to get compressed and heated up at 10 Celsius degrees for every kilometer it sinks. And it's probably going to sink at least at least five kilometers. So an enormous amount of heating is going to go on, resulting in warm winds in the wintertime because the air went over really high mountains. In July, the ITCZ shifts north. There's high pressure over, uh, there's high pressure here. And so we've got air blowing over the ocean, picking up moisture, bringing really, ri the Asian monsoon, really, really intensely rainy conditions. And for us, the Pacific High is going to block all the storms. So whatever storms would come off across the Pacific from Japan, they're going to get bumped up into uh, British Columbia. So here's another video from Pearson. Off on this side, you can see the Hadley cells with the air rising over the equator, sinking over the tropics, creating high pressure and dry conditions. Here you can see the position of the ITCZ. So this has got to be the winter conditions with the ITCZ over the southern hemisphere. So there'd be high pressure and low pressure. So this would be the winter. You can see in the summertime, the ITCZ moves north. Well inland, the ITCZ moves north. And then in the wintertime, the ITCZ is going to shift south. So let's watch that again with shifting north in the summertime, creating the Asian monsoon, shifting south in the wintertime. <laughs> 
So you can see the ITCZ shift north, low pressure building over Asia. It's summertime, the Hawaiian high is blocking our rain. Wintertime, the ITCZ shifts south. The Aleutian low gets big, the Hawaiian high gets smaller. And now let's watch this again, except we're going to turn on precipitation so we can see the belt of rain under the ITCZ and the dry conditions under the subtropical high as they shift over the course of a year. Now we've got summertime. We've, the ITCZ has shifted north, so you can see there's really rainy conditions over India, rainy conditions over Africa, rainy conditions in the Amazon, drought in the American Southwest. Because they have a warm current, they're still getting rain from tropical thunderstorms here in the subtropics, but on the West Coast, cold current, no such luck. And then as the year moves on, the ITCZ shifts south. The Hawaiian high shifts south, gets weak. The Aleutian low gets bigger. So now it's the rainy season for the Pacific, at least for the southwestern Pacific. You can see the east coast still having rain. ITCZ has shift, shifted south in Africa. The ITCZ has shifted south over the Amazon. And here it is over northern Australia. So these are just sort of a uh, rundown of the general characteristics of each of those four pressure belts, the ITCZ, where it's warm and rainy. There's warm moist air rising over the equator. It cools. You get lots of rain, lots of condensation. Around 20 degrees north and south, that air starts to sink, making the high pressure cells in the subtropics. That rising, in, rising air over the equator sinking over the subtropics creates the Hadley cells. The subtropical high pressure cells, the Hawaiian high, the Azores high, the Bermuda high, hot and dry. Between 20 and 35 degrees north, between 20 and 35 degrees south, that's where the world's deserts are. Clear, cloudless skies, powered by the Hadley cells, that sinking air. It was rising over the equator, it cooled off, lots of rain fell, so the air was drier. But then as it sank, it got heated up and it's going to dry out even more pushed downward, warmed through compression, the air again is warming. So it's dry due to the fact that it's warmer and it also lost all that water vapor as it was rising over the equator. Much of the moisture lost at the ITCZ. As the air sinks, it hits the surface, it spreads out the wind flowing from the subtropical high back to the ITCZ is gonna make the trade winds the air flowing towards the mid-latitudes is going to make the westerlies. So two of those air belts, two of the wind belts that we've talked about, the trade winds and the westerlies, both of those are created by the subtropical high. The subtropical high pressure cells, they shift, they move north and south. So some places, some places where the subtropical high pressure cells are more dominant during the year are drier. Other places, the subtropical high pressure cells are only overhead for a couple months, and then the rest of the year it's rainy. We've got the Bermuda and Azores high, same, same high pressure. It just has different names depending on whether it's in the eastern or western Atlantic. The Pacific or Hawaiian high, you can call it either one, doesn't really matter. All those shift north and south with the sun. Subtropical high pressure cells. The eastern sides are drier. The subpolar low pressure cells along the polar front. So now we're talking about the polar front in between the mid-latitudes up towards the, the polar extremes and mid-latitudes. In January, there's the Icelandic, there's the North Pacific, the Aleutian low in the North Pacific, and there's the Icelandic low in the North Atlantic. They weaken or disappear in the summertime, giving way to summer drought. These are areas of contrast. There's cold, dry air coming out of the poles. There's warm, moist air coming up with the westerlies. And as those air masses mix and meet, they form storms. Air with different characteristics brings storms and rain.
The polar high pressure cells, that would be the polar highs, they don't have a lot of energy. They're low energy. They never got a lot of heat. They never got a lot of light. So the winds aren't that strong. The pressure isn't that strong. It's cold. It's dry. Not a whole lot to say. The Antarctic high is stronger. And again, here are all those. Again, we've got the ITCZ going across the equator. Subtropical high, this would be the Pacific high, the Azores high, the Aleutian low, the Icelandic low, so it's got to be wintertime. And then in summertime, we've got the Pacific high and the Bermuda high. Low pressure over India with rainy, rainy, rainy conditions in the Pacific, or at least on the west coast of the United States, dry conditions creating that Mediterranean climate that we'll talk about when we talk about climates. Here again is that global map of wind with the ITCZ here in the center, the northeast trades, the southeast trades, the subtropical high creating the westerlies, the polar easterlies being formed by the polar high, and then where the polar easterlies and the westerlies collide, that's where the, uh, the low pressure cells and the polar front are. In the upper atmosphere, things are very different. The winds are faster, they're not affected by friction. So 300 millibars would be, well, if you're at 300 millibars, roughly 30% of the molecules are above you, roughly 30%, I'm sorry, 70% of the molecules are underneath you. So you're really, now we're getting into the realm of the jet stream, about 10 kilometers above the ground, roughly 30,000 feet above the ground, we're in the jet stream. Uh, looking at the upper atmosphere helps us predict surface weather. The changes in the upper atmosphere are reflected at the surface. So here we've got a typical upper atmosphere chart showing stronger winds with a steeper pressure gradient and weaker winds where there's a lesser, lesser pressure gradient. And I wanted to look at the conditions in the upper atmosphere. <clears throat> I wanted to look here, I wanted to look at conditions at the surface and in the upper atmosphere. So at the surface, there's an area of high pressure. In this region, the air is descending and diverging, flowing into an area of low pressure where the air is converging and ascending. But where that air converges, comes together, there's low pressure, it's coming together because there's low pressure. But then when that air rises, it's going to diverge, which is creating an area of high pressure. And in fact, above the area of high pressure, there's an area of low pressure. So the highs and the lows in the upper atmosphere, both of those pressures are going to be lower than the higher and lower air pressures at the surface. So really, we're just going to compare the high and lows at the same elevation. So the high and low at the surface, both of those air pressures are higher than the low and the high in the upper atmosphere. And it's really important. Often it's the high pressure, let me get the pointer back, it's the high pressure here in the upper atmosphere. As this air starts to speed up and diverge, that creates low pressure at the surface. In fact, that air is going to rise and then fill in that air where it was diverging. And the opposite is going to happen. Uh, when air starts to converge in the upper atmosphere, it'll often sink, making high pressure at the surface. So the surface and the upper atmosphere flow, and even though I'm saying upper atmosphere, this might be just halfway up through the atmosphere, maybe two-thirds of the way up through the atmosphere, or rather not just the atmosphere, troposphere. So we're still, all of this is happening within the troposphere, the high pressure, the low pressure we're talking about. High pressure, low pressure we're talking about, it's all in the troposphere. So continuing on with the upper atmosphere, there's these waves, these ripples in the polar front called Rossby waves. And the Rossby waves turn out to be really, really important. They form along the polar front. The Rossby waves are referring to ripples along the polar front that form waves. So here we've got the polar front indicating the region where this cold air is coming down and the warm air is coming up. They don't mix, they collide and they make the polar front. So these ripples, the waves, those are the Rossby waves. And the storms that we experience in the wintertime 
are in these Rossby waves on along the polar front. And above the polar front is flowing the jet stream. And the jet stream is a ribbon of really, really high velocity air. And the jet stream, wherever the jet stream goes, the Rossby waves go. So weather forecasters pay attention to the jet stream because it's going to determine where the Rossby waves go. The jet stream is a migrating river of wind. It's going to be at, at high elevation in the troposphere, roughly 10 kilometers above the surface. There's a polar jet stream between 30 and 70 degrees north, also one between 30 and 70 degrees south. There's a subtropical jet stream. Often the polar and subtropical jet will combine. Other times they'll split up. So here we've got a diagram of the polar jet stream and the subtropical jet stream. It's really very, very wide, up to 300 miles wide and only one mile deep. So it really is like a ribbon of high velocity air, in this case, 190 miles an hour. So here we have some surface wind conditions today. There is a really big storm going on out here in the Atlantic. You can see there's a low pressure right here. There's high pressure right behind it. This is surface air flows, so none of the wind 79 kilometers an hour. Let's go up to the 250 mar level, 250 millibar level, and take a look and see if we can't tell where the jet stream is. So the jet stream, there's the jet stream, 286 kilometers an hour. 291 kilometers an hour. You can see here, they kind of both flowed together and then splitting up into the polar and the subtropical jet. Again, splitting up into the polar and subtropical jet and then coming back together. And then wherever this polar jet goes, that's where the storms are going to migrate. So far, we've been talking about global patterns of wind. Now we're going to talk about local or regional. So instead of the whole world on average, we're going to look across a state or maybe just within one town. So the first one, land sea breezes form from land and water heating differences. In fact, the land sea breezes, the catabatic breezes, the mountain and valley breezes, and monsoonal circulation, all of those are going to be caused by land water heating differences. So with and let me pick up the pointer again. With a land sea breeze during the day, the land is going to heat up, the ocean stays cool, so you have high temperature, air is going to be rising, that makes low pressure, the water is cold, so there's higher pressure, so you have an onshore breeze during the day caused by higher temperature, low air pressure, colder temperature, high air pressure. At night, the reverse can happen. The ground cools off, the land gets really cold, so there's high pressure, the ocean stays warm, so there's low pressure, so the air sinks and flows offshore, and you get an offshore breeze. And both of these situations are caused by land-water heating differences. The difference, again, is that uh, during the day, the land gets hot, the ocean stays cool, so there's low pressure where it's hot. At night, the land cools off, so now the land is cool, so there's high pressure. The ocean is relatively warm compared to the land, so there's low pressure, so you get an offshore breeze. This is going to set up the same situation as a mountain valley breeze. During the day, the ground gets warm, so the air flows uphill. And at night, the ground cools off, so it's cold, so the air next to the ground gets cooled, becomes more dense, and flows downhill. This is the same situation that's going to create Santa Ana winds in Southern California. In Southern California, in the fall, they get strong, dry winds flowing out of the desert towards the coast. The first thing that happens is, High pressure builds over the Great Basin. And typically this leads to wildfires. This happens in the fall when the deserts get cold, but it's also in the fall after a year without rain. In California, summertime is the dry season, so by the time we get Santa Ana winds in the fall, it hasn't rained since March, everything is really dry. You get these really strong, really dry winds, and they typically spread wildfires in a really dangerous way. So here is... Uh, satellite image showing Southern California. We've got the inland, Great the inland Great Basins where it's cold. The air is going to be blowing offshore. Low pressure, warm water. High pressure, cold water. 
And so what happens is you have high pressure inland, low pressure offshore, and you get these winds blowing out of the interior of Southern California. The winds are hot and dry, which is confusing because they're coming out of the deserts, but the deserts are cold. That's why there's high pressure. The deserts are cold. People in Southern California often think that the winds are hot because they're flowing out of the desert, but really you can see there's a mountain range here, mountain range here. As the wind comes out of the desert, it gets lifted up over the mountain range and then drops down. When the air drops down, it gets compressed, it heats up, and so you get really warm winds blowing offshore from high pressure where it's cold to low pressure where it's warm. Here is a National Weather Service graphic showing why you get, for example, really high wind speed some places as the wind gets sent, as the wind gets squeezed through these mountain passes through the low, the low spots, the wind will get compressed and so the wind speed increases. You get really strong gusts. They're very dry. As the air flows downhill, it gets warmer and warmer and warmer and warmer. So you have extremely dry, extremely warm wind blowing offshore. If there's a fire, typically those are going to spread by, via sparks and embers. They're going to get picked up and carried ahead of the fire by the winds. In Northern California, we call these Diablo winds, the same, same phenomenon. The deserts get cold. It's warm in the valley, warm offshore. So there's high pressure, low pressure, and we get winds flowing down the valley from the north called Diablo winds. A quote from a Pulp Fiction detective novel from the 1940s about Santa Ana winds in Los Angeles. Uh, catabatic winds are also called gravity drainage winds. So all that happens is the air gets cold, it's more dense, so it flows downhill. Some places like Antarctica and Greenland, the scale is really, really enormous because the elevation of the ice sheets are really high. The air is very cold, so it's dense, so it flows downhill. As it flows downhill, it starts flowing faster and faster and faster. So you can get these really high wind speeds caused by just cold air flowing downhill. And those are called catabatic winds. Monsoonal winds, we've already talked about. Those are caused by the shifting ITCZ, caused by landwater heating differences, caused by the shifting of the subsolar point. Here we have winter conditions with low pressure offshore, high pressure with dry, warm winds blowing out. You can see this is the drought, drought period here on this weather chart. And then in the summertime, the ITCZ shifts north. So there's high pressure over the ocean, low pressure inland, and you get extremely rainy conditions. Remember, Cherpunji is one of the wettest places in the world. 89 and a half feet recorded in one year, 30 and a half feet of rain recorded in one month. Surface winds drive ocean currents. Ocean currents are incredibly important in transferring heat energy from the tropics to the poles. Those are gonna drive surface currents, Surface currents are driven by the winds flowing out of the subtropical high. They're deflected by Coriolis. Those large circular currents in the ocean are called gyres. So they follow the pattern of high pressure, rotating clockwise around the North Pacific gyre, counterclockwise around the South Pacific gyre, clockwise around the North Atlantic gyre, counterclockwise around the South Atlantic gyre. These currents take years to make a complete circuit of the gyre. They transport debris. Often, uh, often debris is washed overboard from container ships. So a cargo spill of bathtub toys in 1994. We know where they went overboard. We know where they washed up. And researchers can use that to get a better, more detailed view of ocean currents. So this, this typically takes a matter of years. Uh, message in a bottle, 1992, went overboard, got picked up three years later in Mog Mog, Micronesia. Those were surface currents. These are deep currents. This is thermohaline. Thermo refers to salt. Hey, I'm sorry. Thermo refers to heat. Haline refers to salt. So these are deep ocean currents driven by differences in temperature and density. So, for example, over here you've got warm water flowing along the surface. The warm water gives up its heat, so it gets cold, so it's more dense, so then it sinks, flows along the bottom of the ocean, rises to the surface, picks up heat, dumps heat, sinks. A complete, a complete circuit of this can take thousands of years because it is so large, it is so deep, 
Uh, in the past, this has run backwards, and there's concern that this might be happening as less water is sinking here because there's a lot of cold, fresh water coming off of Greenland. It would be ironic if thermohaline circulation stopped, putting Europe into a mini ice age because of global warming melting the ice in Greenland. All right, natural oscillations in global circulation, really, we're just going to talk about El Nino, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. It is an east-west shift in sea surface temperatures and in air pressure across the central Pacific. The low pressure and warm temperatures in the west move to the east, and the cold temperatures and high pressures in the east move west. There's El Nino, the warm phase, when the western Pacific, or eastern Pacific rather, gets warmer. La Nina, the cold phase. So here's normal. The normal phase, normal state of the Pacific, across the central Pacific, there's high pressure. I'm sorry, let's start that again. So here's normal conditions across the Pacific. High pressure over here in the eastern Pacific. There's low pressure over here in the western Pacific. High pressure to low pressure drives the trade winds, drives warm water. So warm water accumulates over here. There's low pressure, so you have warm water and rising air. You have rainy conditions here. High pressure, sinking air. You've got dry conditions here. And as the water flows away from the coast with the trade winds, New water is pulled up to replace it. New cold deep water. That's this upwelling current right here. When there's the upwelling current, there's good fishing. So the opposite of normal is El Nino. And the low pressure over here and the high pressure over here are going to trade places. So now we have high pressure and sinking air and dry conditions over Indonesia and Australia. Often we have wildfires. The water is going to flow, the current, the trade winds reverse. Now we have low pressure and warm temperatures, so rainy conditions over here in the eastern Pacific, drought conditions in the western Pacific. The upwelling, the water instead of flowing away from the coast is now flowing towards the coast, which blocks the upwelling, so there's lousy fishing. The El Nino, referring to baby Jesus, because this happens in the wintertime. So bad fishing because the upwelling is blocked by this warm water and the reversal of the trade winds. El Nino, bad, bad fishing, drought and forest fire, lots of rain and warm water, but no fish because of the warm water. The opposite of El Nino is La Nina. And La Nina is really similar to the normal conditions, but more so. So La Nina is like normal conditions, but stronger. The high pressure is higher, the upwelling is stronger, the low pressure is lower, the, the trade winds are stronger, the water is warmer, so it would be rainier in the western Pacific, it would be drier in the eastern Pacific, uh, with better fishing, potentially, because of the stronger upwelling. And El Ninos don't alternate like El Nino, La Nina, El Nino, La Nina, year after year. You could have an El Nino and then a series of normal years and then another El Nino. You could have a La Nina and then some normal years and then a La Nina. So we can't really predict them too far out. We know when they're happening because we can look at sea surface temperatures. And if the sea surface temperature is warmer in the central Pacific, it's an El Nino. If the temperature in the Pacific is cooler in this region, then we have a La Nina. So the global effects generally, when we have an El Nino for California, for the United States, generally wetter, however, not always. So El Ninos themselves are unpredictable and their effects are also unpredictable. Just because we're having an El Nino doesn't mean it's going to be a wetter year, although typically that's what happens. And that's it for this chapter. I hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you've learned something. We'll pick up with chapter four on weather next.